Thank you all for coming back. Let's start, let's start, let's start. Harvard time already. So uh, thank you all for returning. Those of you who, didn't, uh, who weren't here on Monday, is this a quick recap of the three things we want to hit this week? The first one is uh, uh, the one we're about to finish, which is the continuum that is migrants and uh, refugees. And uh, I gave some intuitions uh, on Monday as to how uneasy that, uh, how difficult it is to taxonomize exactly and how difficult it is to define. In particular, I wanted to underline that internally displaced people are a neglected category. Uh, they are, in effect, refugees who have not crossed an international border. And I emphasize how arbitrary it is to have the crossing of an international border as a criterion, given civil wars, given the the, the, the context of today and so on. The second thing we covered is that forced and unforced migration are not an on-off switch, not a dichotomous thing, but a continuum with uh, 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 more or less in accordance to some index of persecution, which is important. And uh, the third point I wanted to stress is that uh, uh, for our purposes, the centrality of war is going to be a good rule of thumb for differentiating uh, uh, the specificity of refugees and the causes of refugee waves today. And then we're going to cover today, we're going to finish up with the other two points regarding the limits of common sense in this field and uh, uh, the extent to which studying a lot of this stuff is studying social closure. So if I can put in a final plug for taking this remarkable course, it is that you will learn not just about the particulars of refugee waves and all this entire stuff, but about fundamental processes of social closure uh, uh, which will uh, uh, serve you well in other subject areas. Then I showed you this last week to just illustrate how even over the past decade, the problem is uh, uh, significantly uh, uh, intensifying. Uh, this was 2014. We are now well over 60 million refugees and IDPs uh, in the world. That's one in, one in every 115 people in the world is a refugee. So that's like a little bigger, so you know, sort of like this class plus another 10, 20 people. Uh, and then one of you would be a refugee. That's the world we live in. In the world we live in, 10 countries in the world account for half of this burden. So out of that 60 million, 30 million are, uh, uh, the burden of that 30 million is being carried by 10 countries. And I assure you those 10 are not the fancy countries of West Europe and Australia, Canada, and the US. These are all Middle Eastern, impoverished, deprived Middle Eastern, dip deprived Middle Eastern and African countries. So that's a, a, a thing to keep in mind. And to wrap up this point about refugees vis-a-vis -vis other migrants, I want to suggest some other sort of non-analytic, uh, non but if you want a little more uh, 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 kind of normative reasons for studying refugees in particular. The first is our ignorance of the phenomenon, which is uh, uh, documentable, really. If you look at public opinion and ask them to estimate various things about uh, uh, how many refugees are there in your country, what is the effect on the economy, do they depress wages, where do they come from, a big area of ignorance. Uh, you see in public opinion and even in academia in some uh, respects that people know very little. They know very little about migrants in general, but in the economic migrant sphere, at least they get some things right. In the refugee sphere, the ignorance is enormous. Secondly, there's a kind of hypocrisy of public opinion, which you, the future leaders of the you know, free world and so on, will have to really uh, tackle very seriously. The, it's nicely illustrated by this Amnesty International uh, uh, refugee welcome survey. The top one asks, would you take the, you know, this is the pleasant moralistic question of would you in principle like your government to allow for more refugees into your country? And look at that, it's like, oh, everybody says, yes, of course, we should take them and we are Christian and we're, we're, we are Americans or wh whatever it is. And you see uh, uh, all the fancy countries really, 70% uh, and upwards, Spain at 90, Germany at 90 and so on. If you ask the complimentary question of would you personally take a refugee into your home, look at those percentages drop. You know, well, I have a kid, you know, and so on. So here it drops to, you know, the 20s and 30s, and down here it's at 1%. Uh, so that really illustrates the basic, uh, 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 the basic problem. Everyone is in favor of helping refugees as long as the other guy does it. Everyone's in favor of integrating refugees on a humanitarian basis as long as you yourself don't have to be the humanitarian. And the most common thing you hear from critics of resettlement policies, critics of uh, you know, uh, 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 anything the UNHCR is trying to do is that why doesn't Saudi Arabia take them? Why doesn't X take them? Why do I have, right? So this is that, it really at the micro level, that's the same principle operating. So the hypocrisy is itself, I think, a serious reason. The politicization of the issue is something that makes refugees very specific compared to other migrants. 
Not that economic migrants are not forbidden to us. You need to open the New York Times to see that they are. But the pl and I hope some of you will get to the readings uh, uh, I assigned this week. There's a wonderful piece on some examples of this, like from the Cold War, where the military psych op team, the psychological operations team, pretends, masquerades itself as an impartial researcher for Korean refugees and approaches them under the guise of, oh, we are here to talk to you about food and shelter and what do you people need and so on, and then asks them a bunch of questions about communism to discover, and, you know, big contribution to scholarship that North Korean uh, refugees are terrified of communism, which they ran away from, you know, big discovery. But it illustrates how uh, quick we are to jump to politicization. Everyone wants to use refugees in, uh, 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 in a way that promotes their particular uh, 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 Let me give you an, an example from today. So that was from the Korea Cold War, uh, the Korean Civil War that divided the, the North and South. Even today, you will, you will see, for example, a tremendous difference in the way uh, Syrian refugees are talked about and uh, reported on and so on, and the way Syrian IDPs are reported on and uh, uh, talked about. What is the reason? A fundamental one is that the refugees kind of serve our political story in the West. The refugees that cross the border, first of all, they're disproportionately well-educated, disproportionately uh, richer, they disproportionately have more social capital, so they tend to have cousins in Munich or Frankfurt or Brussels or Scandinavia or whatever. The IDPs don't, who are poorer, less educated on the whole. Uh, uh, but the key variable is the IDPs are much more supportive of the Assad regime. And that doesn't fit the Western political story of Assad is the, cu the curse of the problem. So the refugees are fleeing from uh, Assad, which is a wonderful opportunity to politicize them and to parade them as a reason for us to support the moderate terrorists in, in uh, Syria against everybody else and to s stop Russia and so on. The IDPs don't fit that narrative because the I in addition to the five, six million Syrian refugees who I study who are all talking about Assad, you have something like four to five million Syrian IDPs and those people are not fleeing from Assad. Those people are, freeing, are fleeing into Assad control, into Damascus government controlled territory, away from al-Nusra and uh, Islamic State and uh, others. So that just doesn't fit the, uh, uh, the story and therefore they have very little coverage and very, so you see the, the politicization and how uh, uh, easy it is as a result. And then finally, something specific about refugees vis-a-vis -vis other migrants is really their level of traumatization. So those of you interested in psychology uh, uh, will get your fair share in due course and because one of the things we'll talk about every once in a while is this phenomenon of mass trauma and the uh, equally important phenomenon of resilience. So it's not the case that all refugees going through the same experience have the same level of traumatization, on the contrary. And then finally, what percentage of refugees are children? Does anyone know? Up, 50, 50, between 50 and 60. So when you say refugee, you are, you are, uh, this is a logic, you were talking about children. And the female, the, the gender, of course, is even higher. Uh, what does that mean? Why is it that they are mostly children and women? What does that mean about the men who are uh, undergoing similar conditions? What are the causes, or what are the consequences of that? What are the implications for that for state policy? Those are the things we will uh, learn about in due course. Now, moving to the second big point of today. You wanna, you know this expression that Mark Twain had, I think, where he said, the problem isn't what you don't know. The problem is what you know that ain't so. And so in this class, we're gonna be doing a lot of debunking things that you think you know that ain't so, okay? And uh, in this regard, I just wanna have kind of three categories that may sound a little abstract right now, but as you move forward, and I hope you do the readings for this week because they will help you build a foundation for things to look out for uh, uh, in the coming weeks and when we get especially to some regional cases. The first thing is that we should, uh, uh, the cliche as it were, or the, the, the common sense, the kind of folk sociological common sense is to think in terms of push and pull factors. You have in one of the readings of stuff about, there's a whole thing called push and pull theory which is like, you wanna understand refugees, look at the push factors, which means like the war or the flood or the, the persecution or you know some government says we're gonna kill all the homosexuals or some government says we're gonna persecute the, the Protestants or so, those are the push factors. And then the pull factors are thought to be in the receiving countries or at least in the bridge countries when they 
uh, 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 have good welfare policies or they have some uh, uh, government stating that we are going to be a kind of uh, 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 refugee recipient country and all the rest. And those are thought to be pull factors. In a nutshell, this is a very misleading, uh, uh, it's a kind of metaphor of the world that looks at these people as billiard balls, you know, that they're just kind of being pushed around by these impersonal forces like wage differentials. And then like, oh, this country has huge wages and here there's very low wages. And because of this wage differential, they're being pulled. That's a pull factor. This is utter nonsense. And you have Doug Massey's reading this week points out that it's utter nonsense even in the migration literature. It doesn't even make sense as a, as a good framework in the migration literature, let alone in the refugee literature. So in, instead of that, we want to move towards a less intuitive understanding of refugees with agency of people who strategize, who manipulate their environments, who are constantly uh, uh, trying to mobilize different resources for their own purposes, regardless of these so-called push and pull factors. I'll give you an example of that. The second uh, uh, common sense to get rid of is that you know the world is made up of these nation states that are kind of like, we sometimes call the container model, where like the nation states are really the proper unit of analysis. Instead of that, we want to move towards a more systemic way of thinking, and I'll show you an illustration of that. And finally, we want to move away from the idea that fancy countries are dealing with the consequences of refugee crises, sort of like an innocent bystander who's walking around in the park minding his own business, a good Samaritan who sees a kid drowning over there. That's a good metaphor in this uh, Mediterranean uh, uh, crisis anyway. But you know, metaphorically, they see a kid drowning and then they're like, oh, how can I help him? Should I help him? Will helping him disturb my problems at home and so on? We want to move away from that commonsensical and somewhat nationalistic view to an understanding of the fact that uh, 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 in addition to dealing badly with the consequences of refugee waves, the fancy countries are causing, are actively, proactively generating refugees in our world. That's an uncomfortable, again, thing. It's against our common sense. It's against the way we like to think of the fancy countries we come from. But as you will see, uh, uh, it's absolutely, it's indispensable to understanding refugees in any uh, serious way. So that good Samaritan is in effect somebody who helped throw the kid into the water where he's drowning. And he's someone who helped strangulate him a little bit. And then he's someone who used the, you know, like to push some water into his mouth so that he may choke a little more. And he's someone who gave arms and funding and diplomatic support to the sadistic bastard who threw him into the lake. That's the counterintuitive thing that we want to move towards, okay? So let me run through each of these very quickly. The push and pull uh, myth, or the push and pull common sense, uh, doesn't work for a variety of reasons. One of them is that it's very difficult to differentiate push from pull. It sounds good in theory. In practice, I transcribe a bunch of these interviews, and let me give you a very concrete example. <coughs> Merkel had a uh, something called Willkommen policy, right? Uh, Willkommen Kultur, which was a kind of public uh, government statement on the idea that we are going to be welcoming to uh, uh, refugees. And everyone said, ah, well, this is obviously a pull factor. Then, you know, because politicians don't have any spines, as you will learn, they uh, had regional elections. And of course, the minute you have regional elections, everything falls in the water. And then her position was threatened. So she had to back away from Willkommen Kultur and at some point announced that we are closing up. We're closing the border. And when I talk to, when I transcribe these interviews, it's fascinating what different effects this had. People talk about why did you come, why were you motivated, when did you decide, all this stuff. Some people said, when we heard her saying, we're closing up, they said, oh, then we were in a rushed panic. We decided then it's now or never. Because when we heard the borders are closing, we decided we got to go for it right now, now or never. And that's what sort of broke the, the camel's back. And that made them decide to go. Other people, when they heard the borders are closing, they said, oh, no, thank you. I was thinking about it, but now, you know, I heard about my cousin who got beaten up by Hungarians, and now that, you know, yet some other third people didn't even hear about it. So it couldn't have been, a you know. And then the question arises, is that a pull factor? Is that a, is that a sorry, is that a closure of a pull factor? The fact that they said no more willkommen kultur? How can it be if some people were motivated to, you know, rush as quickly as possible? And something, you see? So that's how it gets very complicated. Secondly, you have the situation of, say, Somalis moving into a neighboring country. And then you say, OK, they were pushed. The primary factors were push factors because there was, a, uh, uh, there was massive bloodshed. And that pushed them into the neighboring country. But then from the neighboring country, they discover a certain welfare policy of Scandinavia, or they discover they have uh, a cousin over there, and so on. That becomes a pull factor. 
right? So it's very difficult to uh, differentiate them even sort of li not linearly, but temporally, how they move across time. Finally, they're extremely politicized. You can't talk properly about is, does it, is it predominantly push factors, is it predominantly pull factors, without getting into nasty, nasty politics. The minute you identify push and pull factors and which ones are dominant, you are in effect identifying what's the cause of the problem. And you are implicitly suggesting a certain policy orientation. People who like to emphasize pull factors love to, for example, dismantle the welfare state. They say these fancy uh, pensions and these fancy liberal <coughs> asylum policies are pulling people. Therefore, we have to dismantle them because they are the major factor. Other people who talk about uh, emphasizing the push factor say we have to get rid of this regime. We have to go intervene militarily. So you see how even identifying push and pull is, is problematic. So let me give you a concrete illustration from this morning. You had the New York Times say our, uh, the wall project is very federal funding will now be diverted into the wall project. Let me just give you an illustration of how uh, uh, counterintuitive and how against common sense stuff can be. Doug Massey, the sociologist at Princeton, famously found a very interesting thing. It's that, first of all, the Mexico wall isn't a thing that, that uh, is thought of now. The Mexico, just to make it bipartisan for you, the Mexico wall was in initiated in 94 by uh, uh, the saintly Clinton administration, and uh, it had a certain effect, and it was measured very carefully by Doug Massey and his team. We'll read about this uh, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in due time. Uh, uh, and they found something very interesting. Uh, the common sense would suggest that building a wall is going to decrease the net number of so-called illegal or undocumented Mexicans in the United States. The building of the wall had the exact opposite effect. It increased the net number of, Mexi of undocumented Mexicans in the United States. Uh, uh, directly against a kind of common sense intuition, isn't it? You can even, you can, let's say we agree with the white nationalist uh, uh, assumptions that we want to skew Mexicans in the country. Let's just take that for granted. We can analyze the question of does this instrument, does this policy help us reach that goal or not? regardless of whether we agree with uh, uh, that goal being desirable or not, right? So let's just assume the white nationalist uh, 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 values and say we want to do that. This building of a wall is counterproductive from the perspective of that uh, uh, value. It has the opposite effect. In other words, the more walls you, you, uh, they built, the less, can anyone guess why that should be the case? How is it possible that building a wall increases the net number of illegal uh, uh, Mexican persons in the country. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Now try explaining this mechanism that your colleague just uh, 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 identified in terms of pull factors. Try thinking of the wall, yeah. Pardon? Yes, so, the, so uh, uh, there are two components to it which uh, one is immigration, one is emigration. A lot of people come in for a variety of factors and motivations and so on. A lot of people come out for a variety of factors and motivations and so on. People come in, they don't always stay there. There is something called emigration, <laughs> which people don't like to talk about. There's something called repatriation, which demographers can explain to you. So the point is that a lot of, there was a circulation going on. A lot of people were coming in illegally and a certain proportion of them were coming back. The number of, com of people coming back was decreased because of the wall. That was the effect of the wall. The number of people coming in was not decreased because of the wall. But I'm just giving it to you as an illustration of the real world and of how far common sense can be, regardless of the values. Again, don't misunderstand me. You can want less Mexicans uh, in the United States. And then the question can become, does this policy lead to that result? And you can see the, uh, 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 the, the, how counterintuitive a lot of these policies are. Okay, the second point in which common sense needs to be modified or if not abandoned completely, is the kind of isolated, atomized, nation state model of the world that we tend to uh, uh, think about. And the problem with this is that we want to think more systemically. In this class, we will think about, bless you, about uh, uh, systems, just like it would be a tremendous mistake if, <sighs> you think of refugee waves as a kind of imbalance, as a kind of, uh, um, as a disturbance of uh, balance, right? In the human body, there's something called the homeostatic system. And it explains a bunch of things about you know, why your temperature goes up and why your pressure goes up and down and why your, uh, uh, I, I don't even know, pH level, a bunch of different things. Uh, but 
it would be a tremendous mistake to take, say, one organ or a couple of organs, like the lungs and the, and the heart, and you, know, you medical students can help me out. It would be misleading in the sense that the homeostatic system as a whole is what you need to understand to really understand how those balances and imbalances work themselves out. That's how you need to move towards rest cure. Because the homeostatic system is in every single cell of the body. You can't carve out the homeostatic system and say, like, this is the homeostatic, or this is the rest of the body. That's how our global nation state order is like. And you cannot carve out a few nation states, in particular the bridge countries and the destination countries, and then say, we're just going to look at them and understand the refugee flow. You want to think more systemically. Uh, this is an illustration from uh, uh, a famous thing in the Washington Post where they charted a bunch of different refugee waves that, you know, with good and bad uh, 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 issues going into here. But basically, the middle of the circle is when the refugee wave ended time-wise, which is sort of time going forward. The top uh, dot is when it began. So the length of this line to the center of the circle is how long the, the refugee crisis went, how long the war that generated the refugee crisis was going on. And the, the, the diameter of the circle is the size, the volume of people, the, of the refugee wave. So several things to know. One is that these there are regional effects, if you want to call it that way. So the first reason not to think about nation states in isolation is because you have regional effects. This Syrian refugee wave of recent years is a perfect example of this. You cannot understand it without looking at the Balkan route. The Balkan route is a well-established transnational entity. Uh, so we're going to have a lot of emphasis on transnational processes. Uh, consider smugglers. The fact that so many Syrians made it to Europe could not have been possible without the regional phenomenon of the Balkan route smuggler, smugglers, a pre-existing criminal network that uh, uh, has been around much longer than the Syrian civil war. So in order to understand it, you can't just look at Greece, you can't just look at Turkey, you can't just look, right? And that's true of each of these regional waves. The regions here are divided up like this, okay? And the second thing to note is that a lot of these regions uh, are in a relation of dependence with each other. In other words, it's not an accident that 10 countries are carrying the burden of uh, half of the world's refugees and that all of them are third world countries in effect. It's because the global north and the global south are in a, a certain dependence, which you will read about. Even this week, you have uh, a very good emphasis on uh, uh, how they are, how they are uh, asymmetrically, asymmetrically uh, 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 related. The third piece of common sense we want to keep an eye out for as a kind of uh, as a corrective, you know, as you as you move forward, uh, is that is this metaphor I mentioned of we all like to think of the fancy countries as moving, minding their own business, and then out of humanitarian, you know, pure magnanimity, are deciding whether to help the the poor child who is drowning. Uh, Castle this week points out correctly that there's kind of two fundamental senses in which this is misleading. One is that the fancy countries are. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, the godfathers of a certain global economic order, which is being maintained, which is the precondition for all these refugee waves, at least the way they go. Not in in some alternative universe, refugee waves would look completely different if there wasn't for global inequality, if there wasn't for uh, 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 the fact that certain countries have uh, 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 fight wars outside their territory and other countries fight wars on their territory and on and on. And the second major reason is war, which I just hinted at. So when he says the global north, meaning you know the fancy countries, uh, does, not, does more to cause forced migration than to stop it. That's the key counterintuitive thing. The common sense tells us, you know, every time you pick up a newspaper, all you read about is how the global north is trying to stop a refugee wave or ameliorate its effects or help poor drowning kids and so on. You very rarely understand the systemic features of how the fancy uh, countries are causing and generating and uh, catalyzing refugee waves. Not the only ones, naturally, but given their strength, given their uh, positions and so on. Uh, so they are doing more to cause forced migration than to stop it through enforcing an international economic and political order that causes underdevelopment and conflict. As the global refugee uh, numbers swell up to 2,000 here, I intentionally missed this because I showed you in that previous graph what was going on. Part of this is, you might say, uh, um, uh, undercounted. So here, people just did not care about IDPs. 
the UNHCR did not document IDPs, and then suddenly it started documenting them and so on. So there is that problem. But on the whole, the refugee population has skyrocketed. This is the world population, and this is the part you see. And as the number of refugees has been skyrocketing, we are taking fewer and fewer and fewer and fewer. So this I, it may not, be, you might have known this, but certainly many people are surprised to know that there's a kind of inverse correlation almost of uh, uh, how we take, uh, how many, so somebody was good enough to guess the Syrian refugee population in the United States, for instance, I guess the total refugee population that America took in 2015, so last year at the peak of the crisis. Total at the, at the country level. Yes, so like Massachusetts took, your guess, guess the whole country, yes. Oh yeah, I gave you the answer, right. It's about 70,000, yeah. And in 2016, <laughs> you're good for you. No, sorry, come on. That's it, this is the professorial prerogative. You never ask questions which you don't know the answer to. But then the trick is not to show them on the slide, which I don't do, so anyway. But uh, uh, consider the, the, the big shame of our time, that the richest country in world history is taking 80,000 refugees when a country like Jordan is taking 2.5 when a country like Turkey is taking between 2.3 and 2.7, who knows? When a country like uh, Lebanon, a country of 4 million people, 4.1 million people, has 1.1 million refugees. Every fourth person in Lebanon is a Syrian refugee. And we are crying bloody murder for taking 80,000 and, and, and change refugees at the global level, most of whom have nothing to, less than half of them, have anything to do with Muslim countries. Something worth uh, 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 telling uh, uh, some people. So what's the, what's the problem? Why is this common sense intuition that we, the good guys, the fancy countries, are going around saving the drowning children? The problem is, and this is where this piece on refugee studies, which I hope you skim at least, uh, uh, is very good at showing, you have, uh, uh, you have a whole field of international uh, uh, refugee law, of international refugee analysis, which did not grow up to help refugees. It grew up to help policymakers. It grew up to help the government. And the problem with that is that the governments and the refugees want different things. They have different preference orders. In fact, what the refugees want is in contradiction to what policymakers want. It's a blanket statement, but I think you'll find that it's true. Three basic options are on the table. One is voluntary repatriation, which means the refugee picks up and says, I'm going home, thank you very much. I don't need any asylum seeker status. I don't need nothing. I'm going home, thank you. The second option is integration into the bridge country, into the country where they happen to be, the neighboring country, given the curse of geography, they flee just, uh, and the immediate country that they flee into, integration into that is the second option. And the third option is resettlement, which means they go through the entire process and then they reach the final uh, destination country legally through the, uh, uh, through the international legal order and end up in Lowell, Massachusetts, where there are many Congolese refugees, which we will take a field excursion to go meet some of them. Those are the three options. Now consider the fact that refugees prefer, they have the exact opposite preference ordering than the policymakers do. The policymakers, number one, they would like voluntary repatriation because that frees them of all responsibility. They just, the refugees picked up by themselves and left, phew, that's great. We don't have to build refugee camps. We don't have to do anything. We don't have to have caseworkers. We don't have to divert funds. We don't have to do anything. The second preferred option is uh, integration uh, uh, at the bridge country level, at the intermediate country. And the third preferred option is resettlement. They do everything they can to avoid resettlement. And next week we'll talk about how that has roots in the Second World War and began very much with uh, uh, the, the Judeo side of the Second World War and how countries were scrambling to do everything they can to prevent resettlement and they do so to this day, at least to decrease it on the whole. What do the refugees want? The exact opposite. Their preference ordering is the mirror opposite. First place choice, resettlement. Second place choice, uh, integration into the bridge country. Third place, the least favored option is voluntary repatriation. So you have to understand that there's a kind of basic conflict of interest between the, uh, 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 between the refugees and the policymakers and the imbalance of power. The refugees are powerless. The policymakers have an entire refugee studies field 
and an entire world order to mobilize to prevent refugees from integrating. So just to keep that in mind. Yeah. I was giving blanket statements. This week is blanket statement week, but it depends, of course, on the country. But on the whole, I think you'll find that it's not a preferred option compared to resettlement. Resettlement in Canada, resettlement in Scandinavia is, a, is far, far preferable to, I mean, again, what are the countries we're talking about? In those top 10 countries, uh, we're talking about Jordan, we're talking about Turkey, we're talking about Lebanon. Uh, what is the unemployment rate in Lebanon? Have you seen the, the procedure to get work permits in Lebanon if you're a refugee? Have you seen the housing projects, in, not in the camps in Zatari and uh, Azraq and so and the, have you seen Zarqa? Have you seen these neighborhoods that, that they have to live in, in the bridge country? See, the bridge countries are, that's what I'm saying, I think a lot of our perception of the problem is tilted towards the policymaker uh, 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 p perspective, which looks at the bridge country and says, we'll just throw a bunch of money on them and then, you know, figure, they'll figure it out. Let's give Erdogan three to four billion dollars. Let's, uh, let's have, you know, that let's have a big conference where we pledge, you know, in the meantime, the quota numbers for Europe itself are minuscule, you know. So that's the general rules. And of course, you can look at specific countries. For example, I think you'll find in the, on the Balkan route, people are pleasantly surprised by uh, a, a country like, um, they're unpleasantly surprised by a country like Greece. So in Greece, you would think like, oh, they might want to stay in Greece, beaches and this and that. No. <laughs> Unemployment, uh, Greece is a disaster. Syriza is in Greece. Everybody's bankrupt. You know, everyone's unemployed. There's nothing for a Syrian refugee in Greece. On the other hand, they can be very pleasantly surprised by a country like Slovenia, which they hadn't thought of before. So, of course, there are exceptions. But I want you to think about the general trend. And again, as, as, as against what? As against the common sense, which just tells us, you know, we're, we're working together here. The refugees and the policymakers are kind of on the same team, and let's try to just figure out how to... That's very misleading. Finally, the third point, studying refugees is studying social closure. And by this we mean the process by which, broadly speaking, the process by which groups uh, uh, exclude outsiders and determine boundaries, symbolic boundaries, material boundaries, boundaries of membership. This is a concept you'll see across the social sciences. Whatever you touch on, you will come across it. In our field, Max Weber famously uh, uh, brought it to life in economy and society to illustrate that a, a universal phenomena, a universal process of social closure goes on from the level of the family, or like you and your girlfriend, you and your boyfriend, to the level of nation states and, uh, 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 and so on. There is the same fundamental process of excluding uh, uh, people in order to define the uh, uh, interior. In order to define the in-group, you need to exclude an out-group and you need to categorize that out-group. And crucially, you need to develop some kind of ideological framework which helps you uh, 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 identify and uh, uh, um, kind of cognitively process who the out-group is. So I want you just, I know that sounds a little abstract, but uh, there's that famous story in, uh, um, I forget who published, it's a famous short story, maybe, if you push me too hard, I'll be in trouble, I can't remember who wrote it, but it's about a guy coming into a train, and he goes into the train compartment and it's empty, right? And then he sits there, he's like very happy, like, oh, I can put my feet up. And then some other guy comes into the train compartment, and for the next 20 minutes, they're all looking at each other like, ah, this guy, how dare he come into my compartment, you know? I mean, he's so, look at him, he's so primitive, and look at the, look at the shoes he's wearing, or whatever, you know, for the 20 minutes, the story goes on about like kind of stigmatizing the guy who walks in. And then a third guy walks in, a third passenger, and immediately those two guys who had looked at each other like, you know, mortal enemies for 20 minutes, all of a sudden their thought process, without saying a word, but they look at each other like, oh, look at this guy, look at that asshole walked in, you know, look at how primitive he is and so on. That's social closure. And I want you to understand that uh, uh, we're going to be looking at social closure in the international arena, in the regional arena, in the arena of how policymakers sell things to their constituents, the, the uh, uh, pu public opinion arena, and so on. A key ideological, so I mentioned how there's an ideological component. In order to have social closure, you need to have some ideology explaining w what the outgroup is. And in the context of refugees, scapegoating is something very important. Uh, uh, that you will learn about kind of as a paradigm example next week in the uh, uh, Second World War, which really set the time for it. 
Scapegoating is what allows you to uh, um, identify, in France, it can be the Algerian immigrant. In America, it's the Mexican, you know, I, you, know the, you know the spiel. In Jordan, it's the damn Palestinian coming in, or it's the damn Syrians coming in. That's why we're poor. That's why we don't have jobs. That's why we, you, you see what I mean? So I, I know that's a belabor the point. But uh, uh, think of it broadly as something deserving, as something identifying this division between us and them, between who is deserving, who is undeserving, who's a citizen, who's not, who's, uh, who has rights as opposed to who has needs, as is nicely pointed out in, uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the Nawin reading. And finally, who's alien? Ultimately, there's a kind of dehumanizing process that goes with the social closure uh, uh, towards refugees. And that's something we're gonna see in different contexts. The problem with uh, uh, a lot of the scapegoating is that there's a kind of double bind. On the one hand, a lot of well-meaning humanitarian people, liberal, like-minded people like us, want to go out there and say, oh, but you can't blame the refugees. They didn't choose to come here. They didn't choose to go there. They didn't have a choice. They were just kind of, the, which is in effect saying they have no agency. It's said for well-meaning purposes because they want to kind of mobilize attention and concern and empathy and so on by saying you can't blame them for something they didn't choose to do. But the risk that goes with that is that you are feeding into this misconception of uh, them being really alien, that they are not human beings with aspirations and perceptions and misperceptions and uh, feelings of hostility towards the those and feelings of, uh, you, you see, it's a kind of dehumanization that goes on. But then if you acknowledge that they have agency in the full spectrum and richness that we all have agency in, then you run the risk of saying, oh, but like if they can help themselves, why should we help them? You see what I mean? So uh, uh, this stuff about refugees have no choice. You know, well, that's, that's analytically kind of the wrong way to go. And it feeds in unintentionally into a lot of this uh, 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 ideological, uh, into the ideological side of social closure. This is a nice example of scapegoating from the Middle Ages where there was a, there was a plague and then everybody uh, called the plague, like the English called it the French pox, the Portuguese called it the Castilian disease, the Russians called it the Polish disease, the Polish called it the Russian disease, you know, all this stuff. In Poland they say he drinks like a Russian, in Russia they say he drinks like a Pole man, you know. That's scapegoating and that's social closure. That's kind of symbolic social closure. So you're gonna wanna keep an eye out for that sort of thing. The second aspect of uh, uh, social closure at the kind of macro level, this one was at the kind of micro level of humans, you can identify it even amongst yourselves and so on. At the macro level, we wanna talk about the global north-south divide, we wanna talk about globalization, we wanna talk about the fact that uh, uh, you have a, uh, 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 at the global level, you have a movement towards uh, 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 talking about migrants as, the, the key with migrants in general is that they tend to be powerless. So scapegoating works best, it's most effective when you pick some group that has no political clout, that has no, that can't fight back. That was what, why the Jews were convenient in, the, in uh, uh, Nazi Germany, that's why the Algerians in France are convenient, that's why Syrians are convenient in all the neighboring countries. They just, you pick the kind of most vulnerable group in order to affirm your uh, 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 social closure and thus to preserve your power at the very literal level. If you look at Brexit, as you know, migration and in particular perception of refugees is an underlooked aspect of Brexit. I hope one of you writes a paper on it, uh, was a major reason for Brexit. Not Polish plumbers like people talk about, but this kind of uh, anti-Arab racist Islamic perception of the refugees are coming to get us. So you have a nice quote here from Castles explaining this how given uh, you know, globalization and all this stuff, you had a politicization of migration and asylum. It heated public debates with competition with different elites who are outdoing each other in condemning the illegals, the aliens, the moochers, the, 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 uh, you know, the fake, the, the, the fake, uh, what do you call it? The, the kind of, uh, uh, the free riders, the free loaders, you see. And the key sentence at the end here is this construction of the threatening other, you know, which they like to put in a capital O, uh, and the legitimation of public order measures and a diversion from fundamental economic and political problems. So it's very convenient to divert attention away from, see, uh, consider the position of a, of a government that has an awful lot of uh, uh, stuff to deal with, unemployment, you know, uh, 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 global integration processes, like uh, from some sort of mid-level mid country. It becomes very convenient 
to be able to point the finger at some scapegoated group, to uh, uh, give people an easy explanation for all those problems. Because it's also a way of diverting attention from fundamental things that are very difficult to communicate, that require political courage on the, on the part of policymakers to point out, things like privatization, things like uh, economic inequality, things like you know, hierarchies in, in uh, the European Union, for example, the fact that some countries in the European Union are second order citizens and some countries are third order citizens. You can't get elected on the basis of a, a sophisticated uh, explanation based on those things to tell people why their misery is going on and so on. You can pick a powerless group to establish the same, an even better level of social closure by uh, uh, pushing on the refugees. A stunning example of this in the US for me is uh, you know but people equate Brexit and Trump, but uh, that's what, what, but consider the fact that there's a number of states that kind of put their hands up and said we will under no conditions take any Syrian refugees. Some have even gone so far as to declare at the state level laws in the legislative bodies of the of the individual states forbidding Sharia. I mean, consider what the it sounds laughable. It is laughable. I mean, as a practical thing, the chances of Sharia law becoming a thing in America or about in, in Montana. You know, that, that's, that's moving Sharia law anywhere in America. That's, you know, it's so outlandish. But from the, in the context of social closure, it's not outlandish. It establishes an outgroup. It establishes an enemy. It establishes a, uh, 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 a category that can help you identify the in-group and help you uh, move in that direction. Does that sound clear? So. Uh, uh, the Waters reading is very good at showing how there's good news and bad news, and it's the same news, and that is that social closure can change, so it fluctuates. And one of the things you'll see by the end of this course is how it has fluctuated since the Second World War. Social closure towards refugees is not a constant thing. That's good news because people like you can work to change that in your spare time between Goldman Sachs internships. Uh, the bad news about that the bad news about that is that it can take a very nasty bad turn. And this nasty bad turn we saw in sort of your parents or grandparents' generation when the social closure towards refugees took the form of extreme hospitality. During the Cold War period, which you'll learn about, but just to give you a heads up, there was a diametrically opposite view to refugees than there is today. There was a view of refugees as heroes, refugees as uh, dissident, uh, beautiful, brave, courageous people. Sort of the way refugees in North Korea are perceived uh, today, rather the ones who go south. That's sort of how the whole world perceived, given the Cold War, given the Iron Curtain and so on. Refugees in general were very, very positively evaluated in public opinion, among intellectuals, and all the rest of it. And so you have this pathetic stuff still lingering from then about, oh, you know, Sigmund Freud was a refugee. Don't you realize if you didn't accept Sigmund Freud, where would we all be? Einstein was a refugee. You know, this, it, it's kind of anachronistic. But it's important to recognize how profoundly that has changed, how we moved from a situation of uh, uh, not only were they legitimate, but there was a general sentiment of compassion, how we moved from that into a completely eroded uh, situation of alienating them, of assuming the worst possible intentions in them, uh, uh, and so on. And just to show you how differently the social closure can function in principle, I was teaching in Korea, and they told us about these Korean refugees fleeing from north to south. And because the whole ideological apparatus of South Korea, which doesn't call itself South Korea, you know, it's called the Republic of Korea, and their whole apparatus, their whole story is we are waiting for reunification. We are not, we don't recognize that thing in the north. There's a nasty regime in North Korea that you might have heard of. They're like, we don't recognize that. That's not a thing that, it doesn't exist. It's kind of a, you know, a fluke. We are the re legitimate Republic of Korea, and we're just waiting for that regime to fall, and we're going to integrate everybody. That's the official story. Under the surface, a lot of these refugees who come from North Korea, because of the official story, are welcomed as heroes. Little kids get to meet them at press conferences. Little children learn their name. They have a parade for them. They have radio shows. People make movies about their heroic struggle against the landmines and how they almost died getting into South Korea. And everyone is completely uh, enthralled by refugees as a category uh, uh, of heroic, decent, moral people who can contribute to our society. Every possible reason is on their side. And then it turns out that these people, given these conditions in North Korea, uh, are uh, social cripples. They can't get a job. 
They can't, they, they, they can't integrate into housing. They can't have a social life. They don't know how to live in capitalism. They don't know how to be responsible for themselves. They don't know what to do with a great leader. This is a whole generation of people who grew up, you know. So these professors were telling me amazingly how they get caught, you know, planning some, to blow up some bombs for some communist student sect at some random university, and then they get arrested for plotting to bl blow up a bank. And then the government has to kind of hush-hush that this is the refugee national hero who we are all celebrating for, you see what I mean? So that's a kind of extreme example of how malleable the social closure processes at that level are. Our perceptions are not set in stone. So this atmosphere of uh, 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 refugee phobia is something historically you will learn to appreciate very recent, relatively recent. And uh, uh, it's, it's, it's changeable, it's malleable. Finally, let me give you so two more examples to drive the point home about social closure. At the micro level, there's something called chain migration. Chain migration is a common phenomenon you'll see over and over again. And I hinted at it when I said that a lot of the refugees from Syria tend to have somebody uh, uh, in w the country they are going towards. So it's a very common phenomenon that the people who migrate are disproportionately high on social capital. Social capital means you know people. So they are not people who go where they know nobody. Uh, there's a, there's a, a, a kind of a, a selection bias toward people who have already a cousin, an uncle, a mother, a husband, a friend, another Syrian, another who is already in the destination country and they are following in their footsteps. So that's an example of social closure at the level of the refugee community itself and migrants in general. It's a big thing. Networks matter. People don't, refugee waves are not made randomly. Refugee waves m are made on the basis of pre-existing connections and uh, uh, familial ties and to kinship ties and ethnic ties, crucially, and so on. Uh, so uh, uh, that social closure you can think about as the fact that, I mean, it's, it's not good or bad. Notice that a lot of resentment exists between, say, Syrian refugees and Afghan refugees. And the Afghan refugees help each other much more than the Syrian refugees. Is that fair? Is that how we would design it in our policy memos and so on? No. But we need to recognize that as an effect of social closure. That these people build ethnic uh, uh, exclusion on the grounds, and this applies to smugglers, this applies to the people who help them uh, cross borders illegally. So the smugglers typically recruit, like you have a Turkish mafia in Turkey and Greece recruiting Syrians to help uh, uh, get Syrian customers, but not so many Afghan customers on these dinky boats to get them to uh, um, uh, uh, Lesbos or Idomeni or whatever. So you have a, a chain migration in that sense, or they're sometimes also called, called a, a cumulative causation, but you don't have to know that. It's just a fancy term for the fact that refugees move in the direct, they tend to disproportionately move in the direction of where they know somebody. And that implies a social closure at the micro level. At the macro level, there's a wonderful uh, uh, exploration of how this stuff fluctuates. Hospitality to refugees fluctuates with the economic situation. Hospitality to migrants in general, let me say, let me be more precise. There's a well-established finding in the migration literature in general that it fluctuates according to when times are good, people are much more accepting, governments are much more accepting, policymakers are much more capable of pitching that idea to the public than when times are bad. Great Depression is a terrible thing for economic migrants. Uh, economic crisis of 2008, terrible thing for economic migrants. Uh, in the context of refugees in particular, the more you have a visible war, like the Vietnam War that's in people's consciousness, the more you have uh, Islamic State burning Jordanian pilots on television and everyone's tweeting it and uh, poking it and so on, the more you have visibility of war, the less hospitality you have, the more hostility, the more xenophobia, the more uh, antagonism towards refugees. That's an example of social closure fluctuating according to the general situation at the macro level. Are we together? So the, I just want you to appreciate how tragic in many ways that is. What that means in effect, if you think about it, is that when refugees need the help of the fancy countries the most, that's when they are least likely to get it. In other words, when refugees are, when their needs are on the whole highest and most urgent, it is at exactly at those times, most urgent economically, most urgent militarily, in terms of life and death, when the needs of refugees are most urgent, the capacity of this and the willingness of the nation state to meet those needs tends to be the lowest. 
think about that. So we covered three basic points. The first is that uh, refugees are, on the whole, it's fair to say they're a subset of forced migrants, which is a subset of migrants in general. But given the important uh, 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 footnote that you should consider the, the, the contiguity, if you want, of that category with related category, particularly IDPs and uh, uh, how forced migration is a kind of fuzzy, fuzzy uh, problematic thing to uh, categorize. The second point was about common sense, how the push-pull framework is very misleading for uh, uh, several reasons, how nation states are not atomized uh, things disconnected from that we want to think about them systemically, and that we want to move towards a uh, slightly uncomfortable, slightly unsettling view of the fancy countries as actively generating refugee waves in addition to just you know, reactively dealing with them. They are not just reacting to refugees. The fancy countries are proactively contributing and catalyzing the refugee waves. And then finally, we talked about how social closure is really a kind of hidden central theme of this course, which you will see. Scapegoating, uh, uh, paradoxes of globalization, which I mentioned like Brexit, and then how it works at micro and macro levels and how it's malleable. Yes, are we cool? Any questions? So if you stick with me, would we want a bigger room, yes or no, to be more comfortable? Okay, good. If you've made this decision to take this course, which will give you substance and will give you, may not help you on the job market, but will give you something meaningful and will give you something substantive and will give you something memorable for afterwards, which is not what you're gonna get in your, uh, 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 in your other courses. If you've made that decision, sign up and look out for emails from uh, RTFs, 